Francis, we have to start with Uber. I, and we'll get into how you got involved there and, and your takeaways and what you wrote about Uber in the book. But can you just paint a picture of when you first walked through the doors of that company, did you discover the mess that all of us have been led to believe existed there? Um, it's a, the reason it's a hard question to answer is that I, the mess was there, but the number of culprits was not. Okay. So the, Explain. I thought that the, if there were 10,000 employees, if there were more than that, I was expecting half of them to be bad actors. Hmm. And it was two handfuls. Hmm. So the mess, I don't think anyone wrote about something that didn't exist, but it was not, it was the case that people were untrained. Like if you look at how many people the company separated with and how completely they did their turnaround, the, they separated with 20 people in June of 2017 and the culture was um, revitalized and has remained revitalized within nine months. Okay, so, so, there, so there are a lot of takeaways from that, right? From that too. So let's get into that in a moment. But now, now let's maybe go backwards in time. Were you teaching at the Harvard Business School before you left to go work oh, at yeah. Uber? Yes, and it was the uh, I was like living the dream. Yeah, <laughs> like living the dream. Yeah, that, that's why I wanted to bring it up. What, yeah. what were so, you thinking? Yeah, no, and I was living the dream, and um, uh, and then you know a, a former student asked me to go and meet there and. And then when I was there, I commuted back and forth from Cambridge to San Francisco every week. So it's kind of crazy, all of it. But here's, here's, what, um, here's what got me. Uh, the service was, in my mind, liberating grandmothers around the world. Mm -hmm. And I, like, I know my mother, who's grandmother to my children, um, like, she's not going to have a next car. She's a fiercely independent woman, but she is not going to be able to drive. And before Uber, this just meant the degradation of quality of life that was unfathomable for her. And now she doesn't lose an iota of her independence. And this is true of grandmothers around the world. Like, like their relationship with their children was going to have to like go backwards mm -hmm. and have a reliance that didn't feel natural. And now they don't have to, and their relationships are, are continue to be right sized. So I love that. Yeah. I also liked how it was as bad as it could be, <laughs> like from reading the paper, like nobody's going to say, and so if we could fix that, we give license to everyone who's not as bad. We give them optimism and a playbook for how to do it. And by the way, how to do it in about nine months. So it's not five years. It's not impossible. So I really, really liked the, uh, the if we were successful, what that meant for everyone else. Um, and so those were two really important things to me. So you walk, you walk through the front doors. You decide, okay, I'm going to take a sabbatical or a leave of absence kind of put Harvard business school teaching on hold. And I'm going to go take this assignment on or this job on full time. And, and you discovered it was, it was a pretty big mess, but it was confined to, as I hear you say it, confined to fewer actors to use your word yeah. than you thought. So there's so, I know you could spend hours um, yeah. and I, and I'm sure it was a battle to get it down to just a certain number of pages. The part about Uber in, yeah in your book unleashed but i um what what did if you had if i if i if i told you okay francis you can only you can only describe one or two takeaways from that experience as it pertains to leadership to culture all of those things what would those one or two be yeah so i think the first one is it was clear that they didn't know what the levers were for building and losing trust because no one would deliberately lose as much as they had. So I think that was one thing is that the levers of trust were not well understood. And if I got to give a second thing, um, people are not born knowing how to manage. It, it's a skill that needs to be taught. And many, many people were put in the position of manager and it was almost a faith-based position. Like mm. people were not, like you, 
was as if if I put you there, you'll just somehow learn it. And it wasn't being, and so management needs to systematically be taught. I think those are the two main observations. So training and then the levers of trust. Yeah. And for me, it's, it, and yes, it's training. It's also, if I go from training to education, and so training is what you have to learn how to do repeatedly. And yeah. education is, if I can help change how you think, it will manifest in a wild number of different behaviors. Okay. So this was of the education side. I'm going to, if I can put some things in your head, you will be able to manifest them quite extraordinarily. Were you, you know, we often, we, we both work in the space of, of culture and have, and, and one of the questions that I'm sure you get as frequently as, as I hear is, well, how long does it take? How long does it take to change culture? You, you started our discussion talking about it actually didn't take that long. If it I heard you correctly, take, it doesn't take that long. Okay. So help us with that. Yeah. Please. So I'll start what? with this. Talk to anyone who has done a significant change and ask them in retrospect, do you wish you had done less? <laughs> do you wish you had taken longer? Never. Everyone always wishes they did more and they took long and they took less time. Yeah. But here's what we do. Even with that knowledge, a hundred percent of people report that. But what we do when we undergo change is we offer one another off ramps all the time. So the job of leadership is essentially to close the exits. And it will come in amazing shapes and sizes, the shiny objects to take longer and to do less. <laughs> hmm. But if we just stay with this is our top priority and we're gonna do it till we're done, that doesn't take more than six to nine months. The reason it takes longer is it's a top priority for a while and then something else is, and then it becomes it again. And now not only am I fixing the old culture, but I'm also now taking care of the fact that I've been sending six mess mixed messages about how important the cultural change is. Yeah. So when I hear you say, you know, shut off the, the, the off ramps, how did you word that again? Yeah, so it's like, I, I think I might have, yeah, shut off the off ramps. Okay, so close yeah. the exits, right? Yes. And, and meaning this is a priority and it is the priority. And we're doing it until it's done. Right. Okay. Um, that all makes sense. Now I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to take you lots of different places Please in our, do. in our brief it's time together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unleashed. So the, the full title of the latest book is Unleashed the Unapologetic Leader's Guide to Empowering Everyone Around You. We, that title is like packed with words that I want unpacked, but we're only going to take time um, in our conversation to, to, to right now to go to one, and that is unleashed. Who, yeah. who are we unleashing? Who were you unleashing? Yeah, so I'm, I want to unleash the potential and possibility of everyone that I can. So each one of us has a better version of us that we can get to, and we're often artificially holding ourselves back or artificially being held back by others. And I want that to be unleashed. I want human progress to be unleashed. Do, do leaders ho hold that in? Do they, do they put a Without ceiling on it? Without intending to, yes. Okay. And, and you really challenge, in, in fact, in just the opening pages of the book that you and Anne wrote together, it, you, you talk about kind of traditional um, leadership won't get us, you, you, you two don't think it potentially can get us to where we need to go. What aspects of traditional yeah. leadership are holding people back or putting them on a leash? Yeah, and so here's what I would say first is that it helped us a great deal. It is not what's needed now. <laughs> so I don't like want to condemn anyone for the past, sure. but right now, if you want to be an effective leader, First thing is that leadership is about others. It's about the performance of others. It's unleashing the potential of others. Leadership is not about us. Now for a long time, we needed to be taught how to be leaderly. <laughs> and so people put up a lot of mirrors and a lot of reflectors. And that is no longer, like that is not at all what's needed today. In fact, being self-distracted will get us in the way of being other distracted. And so the unleashed is not unleashing ourselves. It's unleashing others. Got it. And, and so perhaps we can dive into a few of the things that, that you and Ann introduced in the book. The first thing is this ring of empowerment. 
For those who haven't seen it, can you kind of describe the different sure. layers of that ring? Sure. So um, the foundation of all human progress in our mind is trust. It's not the foundation of all human interaction. We have loads of interactions that don't progress. <laughs> and those, but the subset of human interactions that are actually lead to human progress has a foundation of trust. So first, our, and we want people to know that whether or not you trust me, it's my obligation. I have to earn your trust. And we talk to people about how to diagnose what's getting in the way and the prescriptions for how to overcome it. That's ring one, that's the foundation. Ring two, how can I set one person at a time up for success? And some of our instincts um, hold us back. So we're, it's how to do that. The next one, how do I do it at a team level, particularly when the team includes a variety of people and particularly people who are not just like me. For example, if I have a team of people that are just like me, the golden rule is a great idea. Treat others as you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. Awesome. As long as others are just like you. Hmm. But if others are different than you, it's pretty bad advice. You should treat others as they want to be treated, as they need to be treated. So it's mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you lead groups, particularly with variety? And then it's how do you lead the company? And that's often with the strategy and how it's understood. And then how do you lead from the company and beyond? And that's where culture, which permeates to all of our constituents. Like I'm a consumer. Uh, I mean, look at all the constituents of Uber. It wasn't just the employees, it was riders, drivers, regulators, stakeholders. The culture is what does that. So it starts at trust and goes all the way out to culture. I'm glad you connected it back to Uber there because you mentioned trust earlier as one of the two things that really needed to be fixed at, at Uber. And uh, I have to tell you, Francis, every organization, there may be a few exceptions, but I can't think of them right now. When we, when we as a firm go in and start working with them and talking about culture, um, well, the word that, one of the words that almost always comes up is trust. We don't have enough of it. We, and especially, well, it's true in fast growing companies that are trying to scale quickly, but it's also true in organizations that have hit a plateau. So, I, I loved I love that you broke that down. You and Anne in the book broke it down into the way I read it was logic, authenticity, and empathy. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Can I, can we again? I'd I'd love to dig into everything if we had enough time, sure. but we're we we don't. So I want to pick out uh, empathy. Yeah. And um and <laughs> I I read those pages and I I felt like oh my gosh I need to hide because <laughs> you're, you're totally describing me in so many ways. So can you kind of lay out what does it what does it look like when a leader isn't demonstrating enough empathy? What 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 might we be doing in a meeting or in an interaction yeah. that would help us realize, oh my gosh, maybe I'm not demonstrating enough? Yeah. So the the best way for uh, somebody watching to observe the presence and absence of empathy is in a meeting structure for an organization. Like we are revealing the presence and absence of empathy unwittingly most of our time in every meeting we're in. So the meeting is just like a great fishbowl. And someone without empathy, if you just had the camera on them, you would see that they are intermittently paying attention. And when they are paying attention, it's for selfish reasons. Oh, I'm doing it so I get it. And then once I get it, if other people are slower to get it, I'm gonna multitask until they get it. So you, we just have the lens on them, it's intermittent, without the volume on. And if you turn the volume on, it was when it was only about them that they paid attention and they stopped paying attention when it wasn't about them. That's the absence of empathy. And then the presence of empathy is we are most engaged when we're helping others. And that we are not done our engagement until we all get it. So instead of being about me, it's about the rest of us. And here's the prize inside. When you get really good at that, you can pull forward the end of the meeting often by 50 percent hmm. because you you've you you figured out that everybody has what they needed and you helped them get it as opposed to passively enduring their slowness okay so so what you're not saying is 
because uh, some people could read that and go, well, but yeah, but I've got urgency and we need to get through these items and I, I need to get through it and I don't, I don't have time for all of this extra discussion, especially in a virtual world where people are sitting at yeah. home and the bag of chips and the Diet Coke are nearby. Yeah. And I'm pretty comfortable, right? So this meeting could go on for a while. So I want to keep them moving. You're saying I can accomplish my urgency and need to get things done. And you can do it twice as fast and have twice as much quality. So when I look at a typical meeting, it is so wasteful. So if I asked you to go, just look back on any meeting and say, how much time did we need to actually cover what we just covered? It's like almost always half. Yeah. And so, and that's because it wasn't led with empathy and people around it were just being, there was a lot of parallel playing going on. <laughs> so, and if instead of parallel playing, we're all focused on it. So let me give you one example. Please. If in a meeting, I let the first person give their opinion on a topic. And then I just wait for the next person. They're going to give the same opinion. And then I wait for another one. They're going to give the same opinion for a nuanced reason. And then not only is that going to go on forever, but it's also going to crowd out opposite opinions. So it's wasteful in time and it's low quality in rigor. So instead, after the first person gives their opinion, I'll be like, terrific, thank you. Can someone articulate an alternate point of view? Hmm. I'm going to go faster and I'm going to have more rigor. Got it. And you're, and you're creating, to your point back, trust because you're showing your desire to hear it. And, and, then, I, and then obviously how I react to that, 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 that position that I might not agree with or that several people in the Zoom meeting or in the room disagree with how how we react to that will have a huge impact on trust right if we learn to celebrate difference as opposed to celebrating sameness we will go faster and higher yeah okay In, any of the other two i want to i want to leave you space here to to mention logic or authenticity e either one of those that you feel passionate you ought to hit on yeah as well, it pertains you, to trust logic's the easiest one to overcome and it comes in two formats Either I have great logic, but I'm losing you in communication. We know how to overcome that. Or I don't have great logic and I'm communicating that perfectly effectively. So it's either a communication fix or, it, and we tell you how to do it, or it's a rigor fix. Let me just tell you the one keen insight from the rigor fix. That almost always happens when I talk about things I don't know well. So if we simply contain what we talk about to that which we know well, we're not gonna have rigor problems. What happens though is we get lured into talking about things we don't know well because people ask us a question and we feel compelled to answer the question. And so, and we get out over our skis. So if you wanna talk about a lot, please make sure you learn a lot first. Hmm. Which is almost impossible, right? I mean, you're gonna bring up things, you're gonna poke and push back on things that I don't have the answer for. We don't have the answer for yet. But we right? could tomorrow. Well, yeah, we could come up with it if we apply. And 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 acknowledging that I don't have the answer is a strength. And and to the to the to the name of the book unleashes creativity and and trust. Because I'm telling you, I mean, Francis, with connected to that word trust, there's so much fear in corporate America of speaking up. There's so much. At least that's what we. The, that's been my experience over the last however many years. Um, back when we were traveling, traveling and going to organization after organization, people just say, and, and direct messages. I, I mean, I got one just in the last few days on LinkedIn from an employee of a corporate client of ours, a Fortune 50 company that says, I'm, I'm sharing this in confidence, but here's what I can't say in the Zoom meeting that we just had. So, that's, so there is one chunk of people, and it's a large chunk of people that have fear of speaking up. There's another chunk of people who they're talking too much. They're talking about things they don't know. So that's why I don't hmm. give generic advice. We need a really accurate diagnosis so that we can share the appropriate prescription. Interesting. Okay. Gotcha. Um, let's see. I'm looking through the ring of empowerment. Talk a little about culture. Uh, what do you yeah. think? What do you think leaders have wrong about culture? Um, that culture is not uh, needed to be as deliberately crafted as your strategy. Okay. So I'll give you an example. Every board of directors in the world has a special committee that thinks about strategy. 
apologies for my barking. You're all good. In the Zoom right. world, we're all used to it now. It makes you all authentic. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think that's the first part is that um, we're all deliberate about strategy. I believe every board of directors should also have a special committee that's as deliberate about culture. We somehow think culture can be cordoned off and culture is at least as permeable as strategy. So if you think about what drives discretionary behavior for an employee, when you're not around, your team is guided by strategy and culture. We're super deliberate about strategy. We need to be that deliberate about culture. We can talk about what's good and bad, but I just, if we could just get the intentionality, that alone would help us so much. Isn't, isn't a big part of it too, along, along those lines, the, the fact that we all have so many def, different definitions on culture. You say culture and I might think, well, yeah, we're doing that. We're, our employee benefits are really good and we have free whatever. You know, back when we were all in the same office together, we've got, you know, the barbecue and the this and, and the popcorn, the free popcorn on Thursdays. We have a really good culture. <laughs> Right? I mean, some people hear culture. You're and they saying think that. that. It's hard for me to keep a straight face. You, you think that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, isn't that, has that been your experience that a lot of people, it's the soft stuff that if we have time, HR and that yeah. committee will figure it out. Yes. And that's, to your point, exactly not how to do it. Culture right. is the obligation. It, as, it's the obligation of the entire leadership team and I think the board. How would you define it? Um, I can observe it in people's behaviors. I would define it as the way people think. So if I want you to change your behavior, I can try to address the behavior. That's not going to work very well. Or I can understand this is what you're thinking to manifest in that behavior. This is what I need. If I can shift your thinking, now it'll have you behave differently. For example, we just talked about the golden rule. Mm -hmm. I think there were a lot of listeners, perhaps, that thought the golden rule was a really good idea. Right. I don't have to address their behavior. They're not going to think that anymore. Mm -hmm. They're going to realize that that works when people are just like me. But when people aren't like me, I, so that's culture. It's like culture is affecting how we think. So if we value difference, how do we go out and celebrate it and recruit for it and develop it? So I think that's where culture is like at the, and this is Edgar Schein, who's like, I think the person who thought about culture most, what he said is that what our mental models are manifest in behaviors. Culture is how people think we observe it in how they behave. Right. Yeah. One of the best definitions I've, I've seen of culture is the way we think and act to get yeah. things done. Right. And I think it's the, the think part is where you address it. The act part is what you wish will change. <laughs> yeah. And, and when, and, and, you know, when you talked about the 20 at Uber, I'm assuming a good number of those were leaders, cultures, leader led, right. And so the organization or the team is taking cues from my actions, right? That that's what yeah. behavior looks like, or is supposed to look like on this team or in this organization. Do you agree with that? I do. And it's also why we shouldn't leave things unsaid because people can fill in their own interpretation of it. So when we, when leaders say, I can't believe how many times I have to say this, it's because you have to fill in the voids. Otherwise it will give people individuals discretion to interpret it differently. Got it. Got it. Um, do we, you know, you're, you're now back at Harvard uh, yes. Business School, right? Happily, you're... happily, and I'm never leaving again <laughs> for another company. I'll, I'll play with you. I'll advise you, but I'm home. <laughs> um, is this being taught? Because I, I was in a meeting, uh, Francis, maybe three years ago with a senior executive of a large corporation who graduated from your school. And he said, I, um, I wasn't ever taught about culture. Yeah. So, is it being taught now? Yes, it is. So we have a first year course that's required. Its abbreviation is LEAD. The course head is Sadal Neely, who is one of the greatest thought leaders on this. And her upcoming book is um, The uh, Revolution of Remote Work, a remote work mm. revolution. Like she, yeah. it's so current. It's so current. Mm. That's the first year course. And then it, as one of many electives, I and Francesca Gino, who's sensational, teach a course called Leading Difference. 
mm-hmm. to really get at this. So everyone takes it in a required course and I and others have elective courses. So you cannot get through HBS without it. Interest. It's so interesting to me now that in that first year, you all have intentionally put it in. Any Anybody that's going to graduate from Harvard Business School and be a leader, they need to have the foundation of how to manage culture. Yes. Awesome. Um, what, what else would you add that I haven't asked you about um, before we wrap up, Francis, about leadership, about Unleashed, about culture, any of Uber, any of that stuff? What, 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 what else would you What would I would you... say is that um, there are a lot of people that might be thinking it might be like later might be a good time. And I just want to remove the fantasy that there will ever be a better time than today to begin. Yeah, awesome. Well, um, for those that are interested in hiring you away from Harvard Business School, (laughs) (laughs) now that you made it. They should hire Russ, hire Russ. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Read my Uh, book, hire Russ. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Where where can they, besides the book, where can they find you? Yeah, so I, I have joined LinkedIn this year. It's the only social platform I've ever been in. I just joined it this year. So Francis Fry on LinkedIn, Uh, I don't get spam on LinkedIn, so that's a good place Mm -hmm. to both connect with me and to see what I'm up to, and I try to post there pretty regularly. You put content out a lot. Yeah, that's how how I became aware of you, quite honestly, is is seeing uh, your post and some of the people that react to it and respond to it. You're incredibly well-connected, and I, I appreciate the fact that you're so authentic yourself. You you model the little bit that I've been exposed to you over LinkedIn over the last year or so, and then reading the book, the the, the more that I see you model um, what you're teaching in the book. And I, I applaud what you and Ann wrote about because I, I think so much of leadership is focused on us, you know, internally. Here's what I need to do. And there's so many people who don't feel, you know, they feel like they come to a team with all this wisdom and experience and then seem to be put in a box. Yes. Right. And uh, and yet there, there's not much out there. And they need teach... to be unleashed. Right, <laughs> right, right. No, that's well, I, I think you nailed it. And uh, anyway, uh, Francis, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate the invitation, Russ. Thank you.